What's up? This is Mario and welcome to Awesome Audio. In this video we will talk about the human ear. The human ear is divided in three sections, the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear. The outer ear is composed by the pinna or auricle and the auditory canal and ends at the eardrum. The pinna helps capture sound more efficiently since sound may impact the pinna and make it vibrate mechanically, transferring these vibrations to the auditory canal where they are transferred back to the air. Without the pinna, the only sound we would be able to hear well would be that which came from the sides and directly into the auditory canal, since the rest would impact our head and most of it would reflect away. Only a small portion of sound would make it through the head and it would arrive very weakly to the auditory canal. The pinna helps greatly to capture sound coming from in front of us and from behind us, and also increases the area where the sound can be effectively perceived from the sides. The eardrum is a membrane which vibrates according to the pressure variations that impact on it. The middle ear is an air chamber with small bones, whose function is to amplify the vibrations before being transferred to the inner ear. This is necessary since the inner ear is full of a thick liquid, so the vibrations need to be stronger. The eardrum transfers the vibrations to these little bones which function as a lever, concentrating the force in the last of these bones, the stirrup, which strikes the oval window that connects to the inner ear. The amplification is mainly achieved since the end of the stirrup is much smaller than the area of the eardrum, so the same amount of mechanical energy is concentrated in a smaller area. Additionally, the middle ear is connected to the nose through the Eustachian tube. The purpose of this is to be able to equalize the outer air pressure with the middle ear pressure. A difference between these two pressures causes a typical sensation of ear pressure when we're flying on an airplane or driving through the mountains. These pressures are equalized when the eustachian tube opens, which is achieved by chewing gum, yawning, or swallowing, although it is also possible to learn to do this movement voluntarily, and that's what we commonly know as popping our ear. Sound is transferred to the cochlea through the oval window, inside of which the basilar membrane is found rolled up. If we unrolled it, we see that this membrane is narrow and rigid at its base, and wide and flexible at the other end, called the apex, changing gradually from one end to the other. This structure makes the different frequencies that compose the sound to resonate in different points. High frequencies make it vibrate at its base, and low frequencies make it vibrate at its apex. This makes the organ of cordy vibrate up and down, and makes the tectorial membrane vibrate to the sides, and at the same time, both of these stimulate small hair cells. These cells produce the electrical signal that is sent to our brain through the auditory nerve, and we perceive the sound until these electrical signals reach the brain. Let's consider the fact that different frequencies resonate at different points of the basilar membrane. This event may be basically interpreted as the basilar membrane separating a sound into its frequency components. And the hair cells are found in different points on the basilar membrane, so the cells that are stimulated will depend on the points on which the basilar membrane resonates. In other words, the inner ear performs spectral analysis, which means that we perceive sound not based on its waveform, but rather based on its frequency spectrum. We can prove this with an example. Because of their different forms, these waves seem as if they would sound completely different, but if we listen to them... This is because both waves are formed with the same frequencies. The difference is that I generated the first wave with all of its components in phase. That is, there are points in common where all components start a cycle. While in the second wave, I used the same components only out of phase, that is, I shifted them so that these points in common did not exist. When you add up the waves, this generates a different waveform, but the spectral content is the same, and we prove this by listening to both waves. It's because of this that in a song, we can perceive and put attention to different instruments, even when mixed together in a single waveform. Frequencies are perceived separately, and we are capable of paying attention to different groups of frequencies, especially when we already know how the instruments sound on their own. This graph shows how well we are able to hear different frequencies. We can observe that we have the most sensitivity around 3 kHz, which makes sense from an evolutionary point of view, since the intelligibility of the human voice is found mostly around that frequency. However, our sensitivity falls greatly when we approach the ends at 20 Hz and 20 kHz. Curious fact. If you have wondered why your voice sounds differently after recording it, this is because you actually hear your own voice from two combined sources, the voice that comes out of your mouth, travels through the air and back to your ears, and the voice that is transferred directly from your mouth to your ears through vibrations in your head. 
other people, as well as microphones, only hear the first of these sources, so part of your own voice quite literally stays within your head. Enjoy your existential crisis. With that, we conclude this episode. In the next one, we will talk about fundamentals of electricity. If you enjoyed this episode, you may hit like, leave a comment, and share to those interested. For more content like this, you may also subscribe. See you in the next video.